people didn't realize that there was a very human side to Edgar. He wasn't all FBI, but he was married to the FBI. Fidelity, bravery, integrity. He set the tone. He established what clearly was a cult of personality. Hoover was a tremendously contradictory person, and much of what went on in his private life was exactly the opposite of what he insisted on in the Bureau. Loyalty to country was a religion for Hoover. Loyalty to him was even a higher order. Victory will be assured once communists are identified and exposed. I don't think there's any doubt that J. Edgar Hoover was homosexual. It was the crack in his makeup that compromised him. All I can tell you with any degree of certainty is they don't know. I don't know. That's all I can tell you about Hoover and his sex life. It's hard to know exactly what happened because Hoover becomes so good at developing this mythological personality. The story goes that on New Year's Eve, 1936, J. Edgar Hoover was riding in a limousine on the way to the Cotton Club with some friends, including his close associate at the FBI, Clyde Tolson. A woman riding in the back seat could not help seeing something unusual. And on the way to the Cotton Club, she noticed that they were holding hands. So for me, that was the breakthrough that led me to realize that this story was real. When author Anthony Summers put that and other sensational material in a 1993 book, the image of the legendary FBI director was shattered overnight. It was somehow fitting, especially to Hoover's enemies, that the reputation of a man who rose to fame by gathering damaging information on others would have his legacy overshadowed by stories about his own secret life. In the 1890s, Washington, D.C. was still a small, sleepy southern town whose growing legions of civil servants lived in neat row houses in the shadows of great monuments. On New Year's Day, 1895, in a simple frame house on Seward Square, John Edgar Hoover was born. From their front parlor, the Hoovers could see the imposing government buildings on Capitol Hill. Edgar, as his parents called him, was the fourth and would be the last child of Dickerson and Annie Hoover. The most impressive characteristic of Hoover's childhood is its absolute normality. It was a solid, middle-class, respectable family. It was a very secure environment. It was an environment in which he rarely came into contact with people who were not like himself. Edgar's father, a third-generation Washingtonian, worked as a low-level clerk at the Commerce Department. The father was really a quiet, unassuming, rather retiring character who liked his glass of beer on occasion, liked puttering down to the basement to get ginger beer for the children. The mother was a much more austere figure, a much pushier kind of figure. She was really the real head of the household. Edgar's mother, Annie, whom the rest of the family called Nanny, ran a strict household and taught her children to keep their emotions in check. I never felt that the Hoover family were particularly affectionate. Nanny was not the kind that would put her arm around you and kiss you and say, I love you, I'm, I'm proud of you, or anything like that. She would say, I want you to do well, and what did you do? And well, now that was good, I'm glad. Edgar had two siblings, 15-year-old Dickerson Jr. and a sister, Lillian, age 12. Another child, Sadie Marguerite, had died of diphtheria at the age of three two years before Edgar was born. The sudden loss had devastated the family. Edgar's arrival brought new joy into the Hoover home. In September 1901, six-year-old Edgar entered the first grade at the Brent School, just a few blocks from Seward Square. He had a hard time relating to the other children because he stuttered. Edgar found comfort instead at his mother's side. Together, they sang soprano in the church choir. Hoover was very close to his mother. I think if you look at the family, it becomes apparent that Hoover 
as the youngest, was positioned in a way that his older brother, Dickerson, was not to be the center of two aging parents' attention. By 1907, when Edgar turned 12, both his brother and sister were getting married and moving out of the house. Soon, he was the only child living at home. Feeling even more isolated, the quiet boy began keeping a pocket diary, recording the details of each day. He noted the weather with great precision and chronicled his activities no matter how trivial. In his neat small handwriting, he recorded dossier-like information on himself and others. Like his mother, Edgar's personality became defined by his obsessive attention to detail. Edgar had one room that he had as a desk and a study, as well as a, his bedroom. And he was very meticulous about everything that had to be in exact order, and you didn't move something, because if you moved it, he knew it. At age 13, Edgar began a penny newspaper, the Weekly Review, with himself as sole reporter and editor. The tiny paper, which he distributed to friends and family, often led with neighborhood news and ended with platitudes such as, where there is a will, there is a way. He reported on matters such as who was getting married and in a gossipy style repeated bits of conversation overheard in school. One article noted that a teacher in the fourth division said she thought teachers needed more money. He was always, it seems to me from what little we know, of his background, uh, someone who was interested in collecting information, someone who was very methodical. Edgar's first job was delivering groceries for the nearby Eastern Market. Early Saturday mornings, he would wait outside the shops and offer to carry packages home for a dime. By the end of the day, he often earned as much as a dollar or two. Edgar would rush home to give the money to his mother. In later years, Hoover would tell reporters that this was how he earned the nickname Speed. The more likely origin of the nickname, however, was his rapid speech. Edgar, still embarrassed by his stutter, had heard that talking fast might help overcome it. I found an old school friend of his, still alive, aged nearly 100, who said, oh yes, I remember Speed, we called him Speed because he talked so fast. Hoover thought fast, talked fast, rapid, 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 rapid. Behind young Edgar's drive to improve himself was his mother. She was determined that her youngest child get further in life than the mediocre clerkship so common on her husband's side of the family. When Edgar was 14, his mother sent him to Central High School to be educated alongside the sons of senators and diplomats. It was a big step up from the more working class Eastern High, which his brother and sister had attended. I think they were a little bit maybe jealous of Edgar, I don't know, but I know my grandmother was always close to him and she always thought he was very, very special and he was supposed to be the brilliant one in the family. Each morning, Edgar took the shiny green and cream trimmed streetcars down Pennsylvania Avenue and across town to Central High in Northwest DC. His report card showed consistent ease for excellence with a remarkable ability in French and math. His older brother, Dick, had been a captain of several sports teams, but Edgar was no athlete. He joined the debate team, where his appetite for information and rapid speech combined to overwhelm opponents. Of course, debaters have to acquire information on both sides of questions and learn how to assemble this into very strong arguments. He was a man who had a meticulous mind and he learned at an early age that a person with that kind of mind, in control of information, gained a certain kind of control over his destiny. Edgar also honed his leadership skills by running the high school cadet corps. The graduates of the corps often went on to West Point or other military academies. Edgar rapidly became captain of Company A and drilled his classmates into clockwork marching precision. Underneath the tough exterior of the Cadet Corps captain was a still shy, nervous, stuttering boy. By all accounts, Edgar never once brought a girl home to meet his domineering mother. Near the end of his senior year, Company A held a formal dance with all its members in full uniform. 
Edgar's dance card remained empty. Even though it must have embarrassed him, Edgar saved the document, squirreling it away like all the other bits of information he would hoard throughout his life. Edgar was a failure with the girls, but he made up for it with other accomplishments. In 1913, he directed his cadets in the inaugural parade for President-elect Woodrow Wilson. 18-year-old Edgar marched right down Pennsylvania Avenue from his mother's house to the White House. Edgar's life would become a relentless crusade to preserve that precious moment of honor, pride, civility, and pure order. America would soon be dragged into a world war, threatening the quiet life of Seward Square. Edgar would defend that life in the way he knew best, not as a soldier, but as a keeper and manipulator of information. In 1913, at the age of 18, John Edgar Hoover, or J.E. as he was known to his friends, was searching for his place in the world, some place where he could indulge his love of information and make his mother proud. His Central High classmates were going off to prestigious colleges, entering West Point, or finding jobs in the Foreign Service, but Edgar stayed close to home. It was becoming clear that his reclusive father suffered from depression and could no longer take care of the family. Hoover was someone who revered authority. But in his own family, the natural, stereotypical authority figure, the father, was a weak man. And he was subject to bouts of mental illness that he couldn't control. As a result, the mother was a dominant figure in the family. With his father's declining mental health and his brother and sister raising their own families, teenaged Edgar became the man of the house. He grew even closer to his mother. He was her only support. I don't think she could have survived alone, and he seemed to feel that that was his responsibility. And that was one thing he always felt, that if we had a responsibility, we lived up to it. Edgar worked hard to live up to his mother's expectations of greatness, in the summer of 1913, he enrolled in night law classes at George Washington University. That October, he won a clerkship at the Library of Congress with a minuscule salary of $360 a year, less than he made as a kid running groceries. He worked a full day sorting through the great stacks in immense card catalogs, then in the evening took the streetcar to his law classes. Edgar did not stand out as a legal scholar, but won high marks for his debating skills, sharp memory, and an encyclopedic knowledge of details. He was not a great intellect. He was a tremendously practical man. And what he learned in law school is that the law was a standard by which you could measure yourself. Not an ethical standard, but a structure within which everyone fit. The young Hoover was drawn to elite organizations of young men. He entered the Kappa Alpha fraternity and quickly rose to the top, becoming its house manager, even though he was still living in his mother's home. He made his mother a central figure in the social life that he built for himself. Mrs. Hoover became a somewhat mythical figure. She would have them over to the house, they would play cards, she would entertain them, and she would provide them with refreshments. Then on April 15, 1917, just as Edgar was about to graduate from law school, his father abruptly resigned his post at the Commerce Department, giving up his pension, even though he had worked for the government for 42 years. The elder Hoover had a nervous breakdown and had been hospitalized in a sanitarium in Maryland for several months. In close-knit Washington society, the embarrassment this caused young Edgar was unspeakable. Instead of sympathizing with his father, according to relatives, he was just touchy and irritated about it. He wasn't kind to his father when his father was ill. He couldn't bear imperfection, least of all in the human beings around him and those that he was closest to. On the very next day, April 6th, President Wilson declared war on Germany. Able-bodied men rushed to enlist including a close friend of Edgar's named Frank Bauman. 
Frank was a Kappa Alpha fraternity brother and Edgar's constant companion. The two were complete opposites. Frank liked to drink and shoot craps at the fraternity house. Edgar tagged along, but was still the stern taskmaster of his cadet corps days. The call to arms revealed another difference between the two. Edgar and his mother saw Frank to the train station, where he joined the thousands of other young men eager to beat the Kaiser. But Edgar never left Washington. He was destined for the ranks of government, not the trenches of Europe. In the midst of his father's breakdown, Edgar quietly finished law school, left his job at the Library of Congress, and passed the bar exam. That summer of 1917, at the age of 22, Edgar landed a job in the Justice Department. He was put in charge of gathering information on enemy aliens. Hoover's job was handling an almost insurmountable problem. There were hundreds of thousands of alien Germans in the United States, and there were millions of alien citizens of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. So potentially the Justice Department had to sort out who had to be interned and who didn't have to be interned. Edgar quickly developed an intricate filing system like the one he had used at the Library of Congress. Almost single-handedly, he organized huge amounts of information on enemies of the state. Young Hoover had found what he was looking for, a perfect match for his natural talents. He was someone who was willing to do this very methodical type of work, uh, setting up indexes, dealing with filing systems and cataloging. You could always find information from those files. He made sure that he was valuable to the people above him. Edgar was soon promoted to the rank of attorney and got his own secretary. His files kept growing. Over time, they would be the source of his power. On November 11th, 1918, Americans rejoiced at the news that the Great War was over. That evening, Edgar had a personal rendezvous which ended in an agonizing defeat. Hoover discovered that a young woman called Alice, whom he'd been courting for some time, um, had all the while behind his back um, been writing passionately to an army officer who was away at the front. Hoover went along to meet with Alice and other friends, and Alice did not show up because she had just announced her engagement to marry the other man. One of the few relationships Edgar had with a woman ended in an embarrassing failure. Everywhere he looked, the quiet world of Edgar's youth was exploding. With the Russian Revolution of 1917 came communism, a frightening threat to the peace of Hoover's beloved Seward Square. His whole life, he would point out, it was only a small group who did the Russian Revolution, who started all that, and we have to be vigilant in the United States. And he really never deviated from those opinions. By now, Hoover had earned a reputation as an expert on enemy radicals, a brilliant young man known for his fastidious appearance, his long hours, and those ever-growing files. Files that he would use next in the largest and most controversial dragnet in American history. All his life, J. Edgar Hoover was obsessed by information and how to exploit it. During World War I, he had won acclaim for his meticulous files on enemy aliens. In 1918, with the defeat of the Kaiser, Edgar was ready to take on America's new enemy, an enemy whose radical ideas were a direct attack on his middle-class upbringing in Seward Square. Communism, both abroad and at home. He did his own study of the American Communist Party, and he felt that they posed as great a threat in the United States as perhaps Lenin and his group did in Russia in 1917. On June 2, 1919, terrorist bombs exploded in 12 cities around the country. In Washington, one bomb demolished the front parlor at the home of Hoover's new boss, Attorney General Mitchell Palmer. It just missed a young assistant secretary of the Navy named Franklin Roosevelt and his wife, Eleanor. 
The clumsy bomber had blown himself up in the process, leaving only his shoe and a bunch of anarchist leaflets scattered around the neighborhood. Hoover, like most Americans, blamed the violence on foreigners, in particular the Bolsheviks. Hoover's boss responded by putting him in charge of his anti-communist campaign as head of the new radical division in the Bureau of Investigation. Hoover's mission was to come up with a tough response to the crisis. The pressure was on. His boss, Palmer, wanted to run for president the following year. Edgar immersed himself in research on communism. He began interviewing American radicals. He began studying the works of Lenin and Trotsky and um, Marx. Hoover was planning something spectacular, something that really hadn't happened before in American history. He was planning a mass arrest of thousands, thousands upon thousands of individuals. Hoover had brought his files with him from the enemy alien division. By October 1919, he had collected 60,000 names of people who belonged to allegedly dangerous radical organizations. He helped develop a file system of cards on individuals and organizations based not on spying on them, but on public information like articles and newspapers or collecting uh, their pamphlets and things like that and collecting all this information so that you could scientifically study people who were considered radicals. Edgar helped his friend Frank Bauman, recently returned from the war, land a job on his task force. Together, the two brash young men formed the front line in the government's crusade against the Reds. I imagine them supervising a room full of secretaries, Bauman grabbing typed pages out of the secretary's typewriters, rushing them over to Hoover, Hoover signing them, the two of them rushing them to judges. That November, on the second anniversary of the Russian Revolution, Hoover masterminded a nationwide roundup of suspected Russian communists. The Bureau's men dragged husbands from their beds in the middle of the night with no explanation, often with no warrants. 249 of them were shipped back to Russia. The press saw it as a resounding victory for justice. Hoover and his boss were emboldened by their success and planned a new roundup. The scope of the second raid was staggering. A week before his 25th birthday, Edgar was in charge of planning the largest police dragnet the country had ever seen. The Department of Justice issued 3,000 blank warrants for the arrest of members of the two rival American Communist parties. On January 2, 1920, Hoover ordered secret informants to arrange party meetings in 33 cities across the country. With the help of the local police, Hoover's men rounded up 10,000 suspected radicals. Beatings and false confessions were commonplace. This time, Hoover and his boss had gone too far, and there was a public outcry. In Senate hearings, a committee concluded that the raids conducted by the Bureau under Hoover's direction were, quote, the lawless acts of a mob. The backlash to the Palmer raids comes out of this because here you have abuse of power. You have first the Bureau's involvement in immigration proceedings. They had no authority to be involved in that. You have the methods employed, telegraphic warrants, picking people up, the way they were retained in really horrible conditions. For example, you had 800 in Detroit held in the attic of a police station. It was really bad. You have him very central to this. Now you ask how did he survive if he was so central? He wrote himself out. He said, who? What? <laughs> uh, he developed by interviewing people, by getting out letters, doing everything he could to kind of cover his tracks. Hoover has not gone down in part because he's so careful, because he does what people tell him to do. And he's able to explain what he's done by showing the correspondence, which he keeps. I mean, Hoover's files are very self-protective as much as they are possible tools for aggression against other people. He documents what he's done and who has asked him to do it. For the rest of his life, Hoover would deny what the evidence clearly shows, that the raids were his creation. 
While Edgar fought to save his career, his family struggled with his father's growing illness. Edgar's father had become increasingly weak and withdrawn until on March 30th, 1921, he died. When he uh, passed away, it was all very quiet and private and so forth. Uh, I don't know that he had too much influence on any of his children. The 26-year-old Edgar buried his father in the Congressional Cemetery, a few blocks from their home on Seward Square. He kept his grief carefully hidden. Edgar was a person who never showed his feelings. I can't remember him getting particularly excited about anything. I don't remember him putting his arm around his mother and kissing her. Most of the time, we were more or less taught not to let everybody else know what you're thinking. It was a difficult time for Hoover. He had lost his father, and he had almost lost his job. But Edgar was patient, willing to wait for the inevitable failings of other men to leave the way open for his own rise to power. The rest of the 1920s would see Hoover climb to the top of the bureau and begin to transform a little-known agency into the most powerful national police force in the Western world. In the spring of 1924, J. Edgar Hoover was 29 years old and the assistant director of a small little-known agency called the Bureau of Investigation. Over the next decade, he would transform it into a feared professional police force and himself from paper pusher to American icon. The first thing Edgar needed was a promotion, and on May 10th of that year, a date that future agents would have to memorize, he got one. Attorney General Harlan Stone made Hoover director of the Bureau. Edgar was recognized as a very intelligent and motivated man. Um, he was a very loyal American, a very patri patriotic person. Um, he was uh, extremely effective in what he was doing, and he had a reputation for unimpeachable integrity. Hoover was ordered to keep a low profile and help to resuscitate the Bureau's image, which had been damaged by a series of political scandals. The press didn't quite know what to make of this ambitious young bureaucrat, but some had their doubts. Newspaper men talk about him as a man with no political entanglements. But if you look at more private correspondence, um, people's view of him is a lot more mixed. Um, he's seen as a careerist. He's seen as someone who purposely evaded war service and was able to rise in the Department of Justice because so many people from the Bureau of Investigation and from the department joined the Army. As director, Edgar seemed to have boundless energy. He threw himself into his work, reorganizing the Bureau from the ground up and most importantly, reshaping its image. Edgar saw little difference between training his agents and drilling the cadet corps back at Central High. There's this real concern about moral conduct on the part of agents as well that I think speaks to Hoover's genius in the public relations area, that if you improve the quality of agents, you establish their gentlemen, and thus gentlemen don't abuse power. At the age of 29, when most of his peers were married and starting families, Hoover was spending nearly every waking hour working on reinventing the Bureau. The Bureau pretty much became his family. He made the ultimate sacrifice that a man can make in devoting himself to the task that he had handed to him as a young man, and that was to build the FBI. And I think he realized at that time that there was not much of an opportunity for family life. In a way, the Bureau became the adult version of the penny newspaper he made as a boy, meticulously gathering gossip and preaching homilies. Hoover began hiring legions of young lawyers and accountants. He made strict rules on personal and professional behavior. His manual spent more time on manners and dress code than on how to solve a crime. He wanted agents to dress well, to be fastidious, to look neat, to look trim, look like their businessmen. If you saw an agent with a cigarette hanging outside of his mouth, good, curtain, good, I get out. No way, no. 
You don't conduct business that way. In 1927, after three years on the job, Hoover came across the resume of a man who personified his modern professional agent. As he went through the applications, he would have seen the photograph of a young man, a handsome young man in a wing collar, who looked as though he really belonged perhaps in a, in a brokerage firm. 27-year-old Clyde Tolson was five years younger than Edgar, a fellow George Washington Law School graduate and Kappa Alpha fraternity brother. Clean cut, athletic, and well-dressed, Hoover hired him immediately. Once he became an agent, Tolson's rise in the FBI was meteoric, and that is an understatement. He brought Tolson to his side to become his closest professional aide, and in the background, his closest personal intimate. By 1928, Hoover's other close associate, Frank Bauman, committed the unforgivable sin of getting married. Edgar began giving his old friend fewer and fewer top assignments. To Hoover, it was clear where Bauman's real loyalties were. From that moment on, you can see Frank Bauman's career begin to slip. Uh, Bauman eventually winds up as a firearms instructor at the FBI Academy, where uh, Clyde Tolson is given a lightning tour of the FBI. He has run through all of the posts that a high-ranking official is supposed to have. In 1930, Hoover made Tolson his assistant director. Sometimes Edgar called him Clyde or Junior, and he called Edgar Speed or Eddie, and finally just the boss. Clyde Tolson was many things to Hoover, many things that Hoover needed. But above all, he was loyal. That was his worth to Hoover. He did exactly, always and always, decade after decade, exactly what Hoover required. He never got out of line. Their close relationship, both professional and personal, would lead to gossip and speculation among Hoover's critics for the rest of his life. Hoover, surrounded by his elite force of loyal gentleman attorneys, was poised to take them on. As the 1930s began, the nation was demoralized by the Depression and terrorized by gangsters in the heartland. It was time for J. Edgar Hoover and his G-men to grab center stage. The Great Depression handed J. Edgar Hoover the chance of a lifetime. America was looking for a hero to fight crime, and Edgar was ready to step forward to play the part. May I emphasize that the Federal Bureau of Investigation is as close to you as your nearest telephone. It belongs to you. It seeks to be your protector in all matters within its jurisdiction. It was a role that left little time for a private life. It was very little family relationship with him after he became director. I don't think he even was as close to his mother after he became director. He became the FBI and that was it. Hoover set about creating an efficient scientific bureau. He invented the bureau's crime lab, using the most advanced technology of the day to analyze and investigate crimes. And he went on a campaign to fingerprint every single American. Hoover was reshaping the tiny bureau into a finely honed machine dedicated to gathering information. And in Washington, nothing is ever more valuable than information. One story says that when Roosevelt was becoming president, Herbert Hoover and Franklin Roosevelt were riding together in the same carriage in the inaugural parade. One of their Secret Service people insisted that he overheard Herbert Hoover tell Franklin Roosevelt, if there's one thing you do, make sure you keep J. Edgar Hoover on as head of the Bureau. Hoover was 38 at the beginning of FDR's first term in 1933 and still living with his mother. Just as he had with his fraternity brothers, Hoover often had his agents over to his mother's house. She was well known in the Bureau as Mother Hoover 
a sweet, plump, doting matron for the young bachelors of the Bureau. At the time, Hoover and his men were searching for a mission in order to prove to the public that America needed a powerful FBI. The depression and the crime wave that it sparked were tailor-made for Edgar's purpose. Look at this, and don't waste sympathy on gangsters. Look, is the public going to stand for scenes like this? That mother's anguish makes the blood boil. Destroy the rats who killed that boy. The infamous Kansas City Massacre in June 1933, in which gangsters gunned down four lawmen, including a bureau agent, became the rallying cry for expanding Hoover's powers. For the first time, Hoover's men could make arrests and use deadly force. Daring bank robbers like Babyface Nelson and John Dillinger became the perfect targets for Hoover's crusade. And now that he had all these new powers, Hoover knew that he and his men had to deliver. Edgar felt the pressure of the war on crime, both on the job and at home. He was especially worried about the safety of his 73-year-old mother. They were very cautious about who went in and out at Seward Square. You had to be recognized. There was somebody on duty there to check because they were afraid for my grandmother. I know they had trouble about the phone because some, some gangster got hold of it and telephoned there and scared my grandmother to death. The phone caller was a gangster known as Machine Gun Kelly. Kelly threatened Hoover's mother that her baby, Edgar, wouldn't be safe for long. Not surprisingly, Kelly was the first of the celebrity gangsters to go down. On September 26, 1933, bureau agents trapped the outlaw. The plane brings Machine Gun Kelly and his wife, Catherine, from Memphis, Tennessee. When Machine Gun Kelly was captured, he begged, G-Men don't shoot, meaning government men, and the name G-Men flashed in the news. I think Hoover learned in this, the Bureau should speak with one voice, and that voice is going to be his. Again, I think he built on what the media did, building him up. He gave himself an image the public could identify with. He was the person who you were supposed to think of when you thought of the FBI. In reality, Hoover was relying on young men like Melvin Purvis, special agent in charge in the Chicago office. Purvis, like Tolson and many other agents handpicked by Hoover, was athletic, handsome, always a model gentleman, a Kappa Alpha like Hoover, and completely obedient. The two men shared a unique camaraderie seldom seen between the director and a subordinate. Edgar regularly wrote Melvin personal letters, addressing him informally as a friend. One such note from Hoover arrived at the Chicago office in April of 1934, just as Purvis was immersed in an all-out manhunt for John Dillinger. At the end of the letter, Edgar wrote to his friend, Well, son, keep a stiff lip. Get Dillinger for me and the world is yours. On the night of July 22, 1934, Edgar waited for a call from Melvin in Chicago. That night at the Biograph Theater, the Bureau got its man. Purvis and his men gunned Dillinger down as he tried to flee from the theater. Melvin was on hand to tell the reporters all about it. And Melvin Purvis, Chicago Chief of the United States Department of Justice, Division of Investigation. But as far as the public was concerned, there was no doubt who had gotten Dillinger. It was Melvin Purvis, the special agent in charge of the Chicago office. And in a matter of hours, Purvis was one of the most famous men in Chicago, in the country, indeed, in the world. Hoover was outraged. His loyal G-man, Melvin, had stolen the spotlight from him. His relationship with Purvis never recovered from the incident. I think he became very concerned that Melvin Purvis was getting a, a great deal of attention. And I think about that time uh, he issued uh, an order that Mr. Purvis was not to give any more interviews. Hoover began to force Purvis out of the Bureau. Purvis had committed the worst possible sin. He had upstaged Hoover. Edgar's personality would not tolerate any perceived disloyalty. Hoover's rupture with Melvin Purvis was as personal as it was professional. 
Uh, professionally, Purvis had become uncontrollable, but Hoover himself saw that as a great personal betrayal of him, that Purvis had left him behind in some way. For the next two years, G-men scoured the country gunning down big-name public enemies. Pretty Boy Floyd, Babyface Nelson, and the Ma Barker gang. Hoover began appearing more and more in newsreels and pulp magazine stories as the top G-man. Gee, Mr. Hoover, your G-men sure are good. I'd like to be one when I grow up. But if you work hard and play hard and live clean, you'll certainly be one. Thank you. Edgar clearly relished playing the part he had created for himself as the nation's top cop. He was our role model. I mean, he knew he was a role model. Now, that was another thing about him as a man I think is so important. He knew once the Bureau developed this reputation and he developed the stature that he had, that he was a role model for Americans. And he didn't violate that. I mean, we had kids saving up cereal box tops so they could be junior G-men. Then in 1935, Hoover helped Hollywood jump on the FBI bandwagon with the first G-Man movie starring James Cagney. Behind the scenes, Hoover's men helped transform Cagney, who usually played a gangster, into an FBI agent. Hoover even starred on the silver screen to solidify his image in the public's mind as America's super sleuth, defender of the nation's morality. We must not for a moment lose sight of our goal to teach the criminal that regardless of his subterfuges, his squirming, his twisting and slimy wriggling, he cannot escape the one inexorable rule of law enforcement. You can't get away with it. Throughout the publicity explosion, Edgar's confidant, Clyde Tolson, was always one step behind Hoover and showed up in the background of nearly every publicity photo. The pair even acted out an FBI office scene in this newsreel shaped by Hoover. And we'll have to send, I think, uh, possibly Agent Jones into El Paso if he's finished his special assignment at the present time. He has finished that assignment, Mr. Hoover, but I might suggest Agent Montgomery of the Los Angeles office for that detail. I think that's an excellent selection. Yeah. Have him uh, be sent by uh, air transportation. Very few outside of Washington's gossip circles knew the identity of Hoover's shadow. Those inside the Bureau knew him all too well. Agents treated Tolson's orders as if they came straight from Hoover, and some suggest he was the administrative mind behind the master. He was known in the Bureau as the Sphinx, the Shadow, the man who walked almost like a Muslim wife, a step or two behind the director. I have never seen a man who was such an excellent administrator, even better than Mr. Hoover, as far as moving paper is concerned. He could uh, read a memorandum in two seconds flat and sign it and uh, say what should be done with it before sending on in to Mr. Hoover. But Tolson was loyal to Mr. Hoover, sometimes slavishly so to his own detriment. Edgar's close relationship with his second-in-command was already beginning to draw whispers from Washington insiders. In an era when homosexuality wasn't even discussed in public, some insinuated that Hoover and Tolson were lovers. The behavior and the lifestyle that Hoover and Tolson were living uh, were the occasion of regular jibes, that this had all of the appearance of being some kind of a male marriage. This had all the appearance of being a homosexual relationship. What may never be confirmed is whether Hoover was in fact a homosexual. The only person who could clear up that mystery would have been Hoover himself, and he was, to say the least, not the kind of person to reveal the most intimate details of his life. While Edgar fended off the critics, the most important person in his life, other than Clyde, was growing ill. Edgar's mother, Annie, with whom he had lived for the past 43 years, was dying. Losing her would leave him isolated and without any existence at all, separate from the world of the FBI. By the late 1930s, J. Edgar Hoover had finally established himself as the nation's leading crusader against crime. I give you the motto of the FBI's heritage. Fidelity, bravery, integrity. 
the coming war in Europe would help him return to his darker role as a spy on the American people, with the power to gather any kind of information on anyone. Though Edgar was in the prime of his professional life, his mother's chronic illness was taking its toll on his personal life. Each day, she grew weaker. Edgar had cared for his mother nearly all of his adult life, making her the center of his world. Then in March 1938, Annie Hoover died of cancer. He cut off everything else. He, he did nothing else but work for that bureau. There was no family, there was no wife, there were no nothing except the bureau. And that was the big thing in his life and that's what he gave his life to. The death of Edgar's mother was like a valve releasing pent up energy inside him. She was the only force that had restrained him and now she was gone. At the age of 44, Hoover moved out of her house on Seward Square and into a new home of his own in a wealthier neighborhood in Northwest Washington. Hoover suddenly came out of his cocoon as a social animal. He started going very often, almost every weekend, to New York. While he was in New York, he started going out to nightclubs. His confidant, Clyde Tolson, joined him on his trips to Manhattan or down to Miami, always in the guise of an official inspection. As an emerging celebrity, Hoover began to appear in newsreels, not just for what the FBI did, but for who he was. FBI Chiefs J. Edgar Hoover and Clyde Tolson. Despite Hoover's public tirades against gambling, the pair could be seen each Saturday at the races. Hoover even appeared in a 1939 comedy short shown before feature films. Hoover! J. Edgar Hoover. All right, stand back. No? No. Now. Come on, you rat! But his real co-star was Clyde. Hoover and Tolson developed a daily routine that varied little from year to year. Each morning, Hoover's limousine would drive the short distance from his Rock Creek Park home to Tolson's apartment at the Westchester. At lunchtime, they would emerge from the Justice Building and the limo would carry them to the Mayflower Hotel for hamburgers and ice cream or cottage cheese and grapefruit when Edgar was watching his weight. Sometimes on the weekend, Edgar and Clyde would play with Edgar's dogs, G-Boy and Cindy, in his backyard. They were a natural harmony. Uh, Clyde Tolson was a very soft-spoken, uh, easy-going person that wouldn't conflict in any way with Mr. Hoover's personality. And over a period of time, he found it very convenient, and he really needed someone. Not everyone regarded their relationship so generously. Hoover responded aggressively to rumors that he was homosexual. If an FBI agent overheard any such talk about the director, the information went straight to Hoover himself. The director's lieutenants would then personally visit the rumor monger and tell him to put up or shut up. The encounters with high-ranking FBI agents silenced most, but the gossip still made the rounds. Rumors began to surface in gossip columns referring to Hoover's mincing gait. And after those mentions had been made, a few weeks later, the same columnist said, has anyone noticed that a few weeks after I made that comment about Hoover's mincing gait, he's been seen striding manfully and forcefully around the sidewalks of Washington. Hoover fought back by cultivating big name allies in the press, including the era's king of gossip and tabloid news. The man who knows all and tells all, Walter Winchell. Good evening, Mr. Mr. North American. All the ships at sea, let's go to press. Black. Columnist and radio personality Walter Winchell invited Edgar into the exclusive world of New York's store club, where Winchell held court. In return, Hoover gave Winchell an inside track on all kinds of FBI information. Attention, Mr. and Mrs. United States. Last Sunday night, ladies and gentlemen, I reported exclusively that government agents would arrest a certain rabble-rouser who had allegedly sent threatening letters to prominent Americans. He and his files have been seized. Congratulations, Mr. Government Man. 
Hoover's one condition was that no one should be able to trace Winchell's scoops back to him. It was a constant back and forth, uh, almost a conversational relationship with them. They spoke to each other on the phone often. And Hoover sent Winchell on plain paper, on an ordinary plain envelope, sent his material to him at his home. But journalists weren't the only ones exploiting Hoover's files. With the war raging in Europe, a wary President Roosevelt came to rely on Hoover for intelligence on his own political enemies. FDR gave Hoover a secret order expanding his powers to spy on subversives. It was an order Hoover would use to justify his invasive surveillance techniques for decades to come. With America's entry into the war after Pearl Harbor, Hoover once again took on the role of protecting the home front from America's enemies. But he defined that threat much more broadly than anyone suspected. Without FDR's knowledge, Hoover's targets even came to include the First Lady, long known as an activist for liberal causes. In 1942, FBI agents break into the headquarters of the American Youth Congress and photocopy the correspondence of Mrs. Eleanor Roosevelt. And then Hoover demands a report analyzing that correspondence so that there was an interest in knowing about the First Lady's politics. In Hoover's strict moral universe, even the First Lady was a potential subversive. Though the Soviets were America's allies during the war, Hoover was preparing for the day when he could again openly pursue communists. FDR's untimely death in April 1945 swept away Hoover's close relationship with the White House. But in the future, his power over public opinion would surpass even the president's. He would use the fear of communism to spy on thousands of Americans and define the Cold War at home. These red fascists distort conceal, misrepresent, and lie to gain their point. Deceit is their very essence. Just as he tapped the fear of gangsters during the Great Depression and the Nazis during World War II, next, J. Edgar Hoover exploited the fear of communists to establish himself as the supreme defender of the nation's morality. We of the FBI feel that we're a part of a team to make America a great and decent place in which to live. We're on that team, all of us, together. Throughout the war, Edgar and his constant companion, Clyde Tolson, were in charge of guarding the nation's secrets and ferreting out Americans who might be blackmailed into spying on their own country. But Hoover was hiding a dark secret of his own. During the late 40s, he visited a respected Washington psychiatrist named Marshall de Ruffin. According to the psychiatrist's widow, he went to see her husband on several occasions talking about his homosexuality and then became worried, even in confiding in this doctor, he was worried that, that if he talked about this somehow, it, it, it would leak out. Former agents, still intensely loyal to Hoover's legacy, repudiate any suggestion that the director was gay. Under no circumstances would he even think about risking his job and risking the reputation of the FBI, as well known as he was to the American public, by having a homosexual relationship with anybody. Hoover kept his private and professional lives carefully compartmentalized, veiled behind his dedication to the Bureau. With the defeat of the Nazis, Hoover returned to his lifelong mission of exposing Reds. Hoover's relationship with FDR's successor, Harry Truman, was doomed from the start. Unlike FDR, President Truman didn't trust Hoover or his tactics, and to Hoover, Truman was, quote, that hick from Missouri. The fact is that Harry Truman hated J. Edgar Hoover, and he hated him almost from the beginning. He told Hoover that from now on, when you need to give me information, you give it to me through the Attorney General. I once went to a doubleheader with him and Winchell to see the Yankees play, and I'll never forget, I sat between Hoover and Winchell, and we had mobs coming to us for autographs. And what Winchell and he talked about was not so much baseball, 
but the both of them was very unhappy with President Truman. And I was shocked to hear the, the head of the FBI being critical of the President of the United States. Starting in late 1945, Hoover began sending the White House urgent top secret information, naming suspected spies in the State Department. But Truman simply dismissed Hoover's warnings as gossip and openly criticized the Bureau. Now I'm going to tell you how we're not going to fight communism. We're not going to transform our fine FBI into a Gestapo secret police. Edgar was appalled. He had spent his entire adult life fighting communists, and Truman wasn't even taking him seriously. Hoover decided that he needed to convince the American public of the dangers of communism and show them that Truman wasn't up to the fight. In March 1947, Hoover made a rare and highly publicized appearance before the House Committee on Un-American Activities. Communism in reality is not a political party. It is a way of life, an evil and malignant way of life. It reveals a condition akin to disease that spreads like an epidemic. And like an epidemic, a quarantine is necessary to keep it from infecting this nation. Hoover's speech gave new credibility to the committee, which launched a wave of investigations. In May, it went after suspected Reds in Hollywood, with Hoover's vital help behind the scenes. The FBI supplied names from wiretaps and break-ins. The film industry blacklisted anyone who refused to cooperate with the committee. The that's basic not principles the of Americanism. Question, that's not the question. The question is, have you ever been a member of the Communist Party? I'm the entire country was now engulfed in the anti-communist blaze that Hoover, using the awesome powers of his office, had helped to ignite. From the stand. Fight for the Bill of Rights, which was to take this man away from the stand. The committee attacked members of Truman's administration, such as Alger Hiss and Harry Dexter White. Files declassified in the 1990s show that Hoover had access to top secret information that even the president didn't possess, all but proving that Hiss and White actually were Soviet spies. Hoover wasn't able to give Truman all of the information he had because the army had determined that it could not be used or else the Russians would know we were decoding their enciphered messages. So there must have been a, a redoubled frustration on the part of Hoover. Despite Hoover's efforts to show that Truman was failing in the fight against communism, Give Him Hell Harry was elected president by a narrow margin in 1948. Edgar had lost the battle against the president, but his anti-communist crusade was far from over. In 1950, Hoover joined forces with Senator Joe McCarthy, who had begun making wild claims that communists had spread throughout America. Even if there are only one communist in the State Department, there could still be one communist too many. Behind the scenes, McCarthy was relying on Hoover to supply a real list of names that would support his accusations. And Hoover would dutifully put his people together trying to get something that would fit the general category of what Joe McCarthy was saying. Hoover helped McCarthy as long as the senator never revealed the FBI as a source and always understood who was the original Red Hunter. Hoover's power seemed limitless. At the age of 58, he had become as much an institution as the Bureau itself. Hoover's nemesis in the White House, Harry Truman, was finally replaced by an ally when Dwight D. Eisenhower took office in 1953. President Eisenhower would uh, uh, get uh, large uh, collections of Western books, and after he read them, he would uh, pass them to Mr. Hoover, and Mr. Hoover would read them and pass them to me. Eisenhower knew exactly how to deal with J. Edgar Hoover. Before Eisenhower was inaugurated, he called in J. Edgar Hoover and said, internal security in the country, that's your job. I'm not going to interfere. He gave Hoover everything that he possibly could have wanted. Hoover soon had to balance his friendship with Ike against his close ties to McCarthy. In 1954, when Joe McCarthy launched an attack on suspected communists in the U.S. Army, Hoover sided with the five-star general in the Oval Office over the junior senator from Wisconsin. How did it get here? It was handed to me just now by Senator McCarthy. At a crucial point in the Senate hearings, McCarthy broke Hoover's cardinal rule. 
he revealed a letter which he claimed had come directly from J. Edgar Hoover, warning the army that it was coddling communists. The Senate committee wrote to Hoover asking if he had indeed written the letter. Mr. Hoover has examined the document and has advised me that he never wrote any such letter. Now, Mr. Collier, as I understand your testimony, this document that I hold in my hand is a carbon copy of precisely nothing. Is that right? He could have said, well, what's actually here is a memo, a completely accurate memo summarizing a letter that I did send to the Army. Or he could have said, no, that's not a letter that I wrote. He had a choice to make. I don't think that Hoover gave it a second thought. Hoover had withdrawn his support, effectively ending McCarthy's career and yet again preserving his own. Hoover's talent for self-preservation would be tested even further as the Red Scare of the 1950s died down and he was forced to deal with the threat he had ignored for reasons of his own, the Mafia. By the late 1950s, J. Edgar Hoover had relied on his second-in-command, Clyde Tolson, for almost three decades, both to run the FBI and to share his very private life. Rumors about their close relationship threatened to undermine the image Hoover had carefully built over the years. Each Christmas, the pair took a trip down to the Miami field office so they could go fishing. And as he did everywhere else, Edgar gambled on the horses, which outside of the track was still illegal in most states, including Florida. He told me about being in Miami Beach, uh, and uh, he had gone to this betting parlor, uh, horse racing betting. And uh, the police uh, broke in and almost put him under arrest until they recognized who they had. And he said, boy, they cleared out fast. <laughs> While Hoover privately indulged his love of gambling, publicly, he denied the existence of the national crime syndicate that was behind the gambling racket, known as the Mafia. Hoover insisted that the so-called Mafia was made up of disconnected crime groups and was therefore a local police problem. He denied that there was such a thing as a national crime organization. That, in my opinion, is the basic answer to the gambling problem, an aroused public opinion which will act on a local level through local law enforcement authorities to wipe out the menace. Over the years, some have suggested that Hoover ignored the extent of organized crime because mobsters such as New York boss Frank Costello were giving Edgar hot tips on fixed races. Frank Costello said, no one will ever know how many races I had to fix for that bastard. And Carmine Lombardozzi, the finance minister of the Gambino mob, he said Hoover was in our pocket. He was not someone we needed to fear. The rumors of Hoover's connections to gangsters cast a dark shadow over the other rumors about his life, the ones about his homosexuality. The son of New York godfather Joe Bonanno claims to have seen a blackmail photo in the office of notorious mob defense attorney Roy Cohn. Roy brought out an envelope that had some pictures. And that was the first time I had seen them. And they were pictures of Hoover cross-dressing. And that was when I was convinced that all the stories that I heard over the years were in fact true. I very early heard, don't worry about J. Edgar Hoover, he won't bother us because he's a homosexual. It doesn't really matter whether there really was such a photograph or not. If Hoover was led to believe there was such a photograph, and if he was actively homosexual, that would have struck terror into his soul. That kind of blackmail wouldn't require him to do anything. On the contrary, it required him to do nothing. And nothing is exactly what J. Edgar Hoover did about the Mafia. Despite the fact that the image of Hoover as a cross-dresser has thoroughly permeated popular culture, many people who knew Hoover at the time insist that the persistent rumors have absolutely no basis in fact. 
I don't believe much of what has been written and much of what has appeared in documentaries uh, that depict him as some figure with links to organized crime. That's the craziest thing I ever heard of, and I think anybody who's close to it knows the idea is crazy. As I think is the suggestion that he was a, that he was a homosexual. Hoover didn't want to fight the mob, they say, not because he was corrupt, but because he didn't believe he could win. The techniques he used to fight communists like wiretaps and break-ins were inadmissible in court. Against the Communist Party, you can leak information to, to, to friendly senators like McCarthy or to committees like HUAC or to reporters like Walter Trohan, and you can color public opinion. But the only way you get the mafia is if you prosecute them and throw them in jail. Hoover could no longer claim the mafia didn't exist after a state trooper raided this private home in Appalachian, New York in November 1957 and stumbled onto a meeting of more than 60 mafia leaders from around the country. It became a matter of ridicule that J. Edgar Hoover had been denying the existence of a national crime organization. And in fact, within a few years, the FBI had to abandon that pretense because the public would no longer buy it. Let every nation know. While it's possible the underworld had some kind of damaging information about Hoover, by 1961, the director was holding on to evidence about the secret sex life of the new man in the White House. He indicated he wanted me to check files on John F. Kennedy to see what kind of person the, uh, the new president was. I did check files. I came up with the uh, Inga Arvid case, uh, the suspected German espionage agent whom uh, Kennedy had had numerous uh, sexual uh, rendezvous with. Back during World War II, Hoover had put Inga Arvid under constant surveillance and accidentally stumbled onto young Ensign Kennedy's affair. The Bureau's bugs recorded Kennedy calling her Inga Binga and her calling him Honeysuckle. Hoover quietly moved the Kennedy transcripts to the personal and confidential files in his own office. JFK no doubt suspected that Hoover had files on his sexual liaisons, and in one of his first official acts, Kennedy reappointed Hoover as director of the FBI. Then Kennedy turned around and made his 35-year-old brother Bobby attorney general, Hoover's new boss. And Bobby's agenda was to fight the mob with all the vigor Hoover had reserved for fighting Reds. The two men clashed on nearly every policy decision and constantly harassed each other with petty jibes. Ridiculous. FBI tour directors began reminding visitors that Bobby Kennedy wasn't even born when Hoover became director. Hoover was offended by Bobby Shirtsleeve's approach to, to uh, administration. Uh, he was offended, I think, by his youth. He thought it was demeaning that Robert Kennedy put up posters done by his children in school all over the walls of this gigantic office that he had. Hoover at one point called that obscene. Uh, obs I mean, children's posters, obscene. In 1963, at the age of 68, Hoover was feeling old. His files insulated the Bureau from external attacks, but they couldn't keep the forces of change at bay. America was becoming almost unrecognizable to a man who was born before the invention of the airplane. President Kennedy has been assassinated. It's official now. The president is dead. Out of a national tragedy, a close friend would become president and try to accomplish what no one else thought possible, force Hoover to deal with the realities of the 1960s. By 1963, J. Edgar Hoover was becoming isolated and entrenched within the FBI he had created. Then, just after lunchtime on November 22nd, Hoover called his boss, Bobby Kennedy, to tell him that his brother, the president, had been shot in Dallas. Got a call from Bobby saying that the president was, was dead, that he'd gotten a call from Hoover. And Bobby said, I think Hoover enjoyed telling me. The next day, while most of the United States was 
reeling with the size of the tragedy, Hoover went to the races. And what work he did in terms of the FBI's follow-up on the assassination, he did on the telephone from, from his box at the races. 68-year-old Hoover was much more comfortable with a newly sworn-in president, 55-year-old Lyndon Johnson. The two men were longtime neighbors and shared a love for political gossip. After the shock of the assassination, LBJ needed the stability Hoover represented to most Americans as a symbol of law and order. President Johnson waived the government's mandatory retirement age of 70, reappointed Hoover, and effectively crowned him director for life. And again, Edgar, congratulations, and accept the gratitude of a grateful nation. Privately, LBJ was wary of Hoover's unchecked power in the information that might be in those infamous FBI files about his dark secrets. Mr. Johnson, I think, had a very healthy respect and a tinge of fear concerning Mr. Hoover, the fate that Mr. Hoover might kick over some traces, uh, which I, I don't think we had anyhow, but uh, nevertheless, uh, Mr. Johnson didn't know what we had, what Hoover had in his files concerning him. Yet the real secret the FBI had to protect was not about the president, but about Hoover himself. Edgar was approaching 70 and developing a habit of making bizarre comments that the people around him were afraid to question. And one day, a whole, uh, he saw a whole parade of uh, about to become special agents. And he made the remark to somebody, probably Clyde Tolson, got a couple of pinheads in that class. They didn't know what to do. They knew that there were some people of whom who were disapproved. They didn't know what he meant by pinheads, but someone got the bright idea. While they're out doing something else, go into their lockers, check the hats. And the guys with the small heads, out. And so, you know, you never knew. His notes on FBI memos scrawled in his distinctive blue ink became his primary form of communication. Responding to a critical remark about the Bureau from the French philosopher Jean-Paul Sartre, Hoover wrote, find out who Sartre is. But he couldn't stay barricaded forever. On June 22, 1964, three civil rights workers were declared missing in Mississippi. It was widely assumed that the Ku Klux Klan was responsible. President Johnson made it clear to the director that solving the case was a priority. The next month, Hoover personally went to Jackson, Mississippi to open a bureau field office, signaling the beginning of the FBI's assault on the Klan. I don't know what to do that you came to Jackson. Well, that's awful nice time. I think that Johnson persuaded Hoover to open that FBI office in Jackson. LBJ was very good at persuading people. And secondly, I think, to give Hoover a little more credit, I think that violence in the South was getting out of control. And I think that that did, in fact, concern him. Johnson, the consummate politician, had maneuvered Hoover, the ultimate bureaucrat, into a dramatic gesture to the civil rights movement. But just as he had with the mob, Hoover still made it clear that the FBI didn't have the jurisdiction to get involved in protecting blacks from racial violence. The FBI is not a police organization. It's purely an investigative organization. And the protection of individual citizens, either natives of the state or coming into the state, is a matter for the local authorities. But the FBI can make arrests, uh, on-the-spot arrests. They do it in many other cases where you have narcotics or auto thefts or bank robberies. Uh, it's only when you come to civil rights that there is this uh, tendency to be rather slow. But I'm not... Uh... Hoover was shocked that the Reverend Martin Luther King Jr. would dare to criticize the Bureau. He ordered his agents to bug King's motel rooms, where they recorded alleged extramarital affairs. He actually played those tapes for reporters. Hoover was obsessed with King. He wanted to bring King down as a leader. Why that was, I think, was because he criticized the Bureau. The fact that Dr. King was black and criticized the Bureau probably made it that much worse. When King was chosen for the Nobel Peace Prize in October 1964, it was almost more than Edgar could stand. He told a group of women reporters at a National Press Club briefing that King was, quote, the most notorious liar in the country. To have J. Edgar Hoover call Martin Luther King a notorious liar 
Hoover sounded to many people for the first time like a public nutball. A dogmatic Hoover protege named William Sullivan, head of domestic intelligence, went so far as to send copies of the surveillance tapes to King's home in Atlanta. Included inside was an anonymous threat. The letter ended with a sinister suggestion saying, quote, there is but one way out for you. You better take it before your filthy, abnormal, fraudulent self is bared to the nation. That's when Hoover starts playing, not law enforcement, uh, but uh, manipulator of the society's processes. Uh, and that was illegal, that was immoral, that was unconstitutional, and nobody can say anything nice about that. Although no one has ever proven that Hoover ordered Sullivan to send the letter, the director clearly wanted to destroy King's reputation. Hoover was incensed that King, who was in his eyes a philandering opportunist, could win international acclaim. He yearned for recognition for one of his own. In 1965, he convinced President Johnson to present his longtime companion, Clyde Tolson, with the President's Distinguished Civil Service Award in a White House ceremony. Unfortunately, Edgar had to accept the award in his friend's place. Clyde's health was failing and over the next two years, he was incapacitated by two strokes. Hoover felt the world around him caving in. 1968 seemed like a repeat of 1919, when Hoover was a young government lawyer fighting radicals. That April, Reverend King was murdered at a motel in Memphis. Inner cities across the U.S. erupted in rioting. Then two months later in June, Bobby Kennedy was killed at the Ambassador Hotel in Los Angeles, just after winning California's Democratic presidential primary. Hoover was appalled by the riots and the anti-war demonstrations that seemed to be sweeping the nation. He was only too eager to fulfill President Johnson's mandate to infiltrate the anti-war movement and stem the tide of criticism toward the presidency. He had been standing on a foundation of what he considered truth, and suddenly that foundation was, was collapsing. He thought the world had gone crazy. He saw all of that change as a threat to values that um, he had lived his life by and thought were the essence of um, the idea of the America that he loved. In Hoover's last years, his inability to adjust to the times and understand the changing world around him would prove profoundly damaging to his beloved FBI. By 1968, J. Edgar Hoover's constant companion, Clyde Tolson, had suffered two strokes and was barely able to function in his job. When Clyde Tolson was no longer able to work with Mr. Hoover, Mr. Hoover became in a way, radically more isolated. He was very isolated before that, but at least he had this one person who, had, who was sociable and who would be with him and could discuss things with him. And that was gone. Now it was the man alone. Visitors to Hoover's office often encountered a rambling old man trapped in the past. I just sat there and shut up while he went on and on about Eleanor Roosevelt. He was on an Eleanor Roosevelt tear. And uh, he kept me in there for 40, 45 minutes, which was just phenomenal. He'd just start talking, and he'd keep talking. And pretty soon, he'd come around to Dr. King for a little while, and he'd say some mean things. And I'd try to interrupt and say, well, I don't know, wait a minute. And, but he'd keep going. Nixon, do solemnly swear. I, Richard Bilhouse Nixon, do solemnly swear. In January 1969, at the age of 74, Edgar watched from his office balcony as the inaugural parade carried Richard Nixon down Pennsylvania Avenue to the White House. Nixon was the eighth president during Hoover's long reign as director, and like LBJ, an old ally. When Mr. Nixon became president, Mr. Hoover thought it was going to be a, a very easy field. It was uh, Dick this and Dick that, and, and Dick asked me to do this, and he was, went to the White House quite frequently for state dinners, and they were closed. Once Nixon became president, he used the bully pulpit to become Hoover's biggest supporter. 
Now, incidentally, they say sometimes that Mr. Hoover is controversial. Let me tell you something. Anybody who's strong, anybody for fights who fights for what he believes in, anybody who stands up when it's tough is bound to be controversial. Right away, Nixon, like many presidents before him, asked Hoover to spy on his political enemies. Nixon was obsessed with stopping leaks to reporters about the secret bombings in Cambodia. He wanted the director to tap the phones of journalists and even White House staff. But in the twilight of his career, Hoover was becoming concerned about his historical legacy. Hoover insisted on written permission from Attorney General John Mitchell to provide a paper trail that would shield him from blame. Though the White House gave in to Hoover's demands and the taps were installed on his terms, Nixon and his aides were growing frustrated and convinced that Hoover had been director for far too long. Inside the bureau, Hoover's trusted protege, William Sullivan, was in charge of the sensitive wiretaps. Sullivan, like those inside the White House, also thought it was time for Hoover to go. Sullivan and then Charles Brennan uh, were telling me uh, horror stories about how Hoover was running the FBI and that uh, if, if something uh, wasn't done, he would destroy the Bureau. Hoover was well aware of Sullivan's new friends at the White House, and as rumors circulated about Sullivan's growing influence, Hoover grew suspicious of him. He was viewed as a threat, and it fits the pattern, and anybody who Melvin Purvis or anybody else who looks like they're in a position to succeed uh, becomes a threat. Then Sullivan overplayed his hand. He began publicly contradicting the director and even criticized him in a letter sent directly to his home. So he ended up this long letter to Hoover saying, for the good of the FBI and the good of the country, you should retire. It didn't set so well with Mr. Hoover. Sullivan was branded as a heretic, and ultimately he came to work one day, and his office was gone. His locks were changed, his name was off his door. Loyalty was everything to Hoover. I mean, he expected loyalty, and he got it. If he thought you weren't, he'd, um, um, he would slash your throat. There are bleeding torsos all over the record of the FBI when he sensed that anybody least bit disloyal to him. By 1971, the FBI was under attack from all sides as an authoritarian force trapped in the past. That spring, Hoover appeared on the cover of Life magazine, portrayed as a Roman emperor. Like Caesar, Hoover had real enemies within the government. Nixon more and more talked of the possibility that this old man should go, that it was time to go, that he was just clinging to the wreckage, and that he was effectively becoming senile. In October 1971, plans were made for President Nixon and Hoover to have a breakfast meeting in which Nixon would gently force him to resign from his post. We waited and waited and waited, and no call came. So then I called Ehrlichman. Because this is not the first time we were told that uh, he was gone. And I said, what happened? He said, uh, I'm going to use a word maybe I shouldn't be using. <laughs> he didn't have the balls for it. <laughs> Hoover had survived the meeting with his job intact, but his dignity damaged. The rumors of senility and abuse of power were devastating to a man who had spent nearly half a century brilliantly crafting a public image as America's vigilant defender. Excellent. Is there any uh, uh, response on your part to the suggestions that you resign? That's the wish, father to the thought. Six months after Sullivan's resignation, Hoover was still haunted by the break with one of his inner circle. He could hardly talk about anything else. It really affected him very, very badly. What he said to me was, I have never been so disappointed in anybody in my life. He called him Bill said I treated him like a son and he pulled the wool over my eyes. The constant barrage of demands for his resignation were wearing on the 77-year-old director. On May 1st, a week before Hoover's 48th anniversary as director of the FBI, he left the office shortly before 6. He stopped off at Clyde Tolson's apartment for dinner and arrived home just after 10 p.m. The next morning, Hoover's former chauffeur of 37 years retired agent James Crawford 
arrived at the house to work on Hoover's rose bushes. When the director didn't come downstairs for breakfast, Crawford went in to look for him. He found Hoover's lifeless body lying at the foot of his bed. The coroner ruled it a heart attack. When the news of Hoover's death reached the White House, the immediate reaction was find out where the skeletons were. Even in death, people in power were afraid of Hoover, afraid of what was sitting in his files at the office. The president ordered Hoover's office sealed, but according to the director's wishes, Helen Gandy, his secretary since 1918, had already moved the director's personal and confidential files to her office, and then secretly within days to the basement of Hoover's house. Clyde Tolson moved into the guest bedroom while Gandy sorted through thousands of pages of the most derogatory material the Bureau had ever collected. Nearly five decades worth of Hoover's secret files were systematically destroyed. Gandy would later testify that she only destroyed the director's personal materials and not Bureau information. But declassified FBI files indicate that the public has only seen a small portion of Hoover's worst offenses. The director did not hesitate uh, to collect and maintain in his office derogatory information on presidents and members of Congress. They were non-record records. They were not serialized. They did not exist. Thus, these records could be safely destroyed. Congress ordered that Hoover's body lie in state in the Capitol Rotunda, an honor never before accorded to a civil servant. Eight servicemen carried the lead-lined coffin weighing over 1,000 pounds into the National Presbyterian Church. President Nixon delivered the eulogy. J. Edgar Hoover was one of the giants. His long life brimmed over with magnificent achievement and dedicated service to this country, which he loved so well. I remember all along the route, there were police officers from all over the place in dress uniforms on both sides of the street. We went by, they saluted. There must have been thousands of them paying their respects. Edgar's body was laid to rest in the Congressional Cemetery near his boyhood home on Seward Square, and his name was added to the family headstone. Clyde Tolson, the beneficiary of almost all of Hoover's estate, died three years later and was buried only a few graves away. The simple grave in a quiet corner of the Capitol belies the extraordinary impact that J. Edgar Hoover had on America not only on its law enforcement, but its politics and its culture. His legacy has been that of a pathological example of the misuse of authority and the abuses of power. He's really become a symbol of violations of civil liberties and of hostility to civil rights. And that is a tragedy because there were great potentials in this man, and he fulfilled so many of those potentials. He was a shell of a man, that he, he was only what he had created as the image of himself. J. Edgar Hoover, the director of the FBI. He was a man with blinders uh, at a time when his whole world was being turned upside down. But he didn't take the blinders off, he didn't want to see, he kept looking right straight ahead. And as a result, he virtually wrecked the reputation of the agency, a reputation he almost single-handedly had created and built. I think his legacy leaves a great deal to be proud of and a great deal to be ashamed of. And I don't know which, where it would be on the balance. I think most people today would put the balance on the shame side, and I think that's probably wrong. I don't think they're that far out of balance. He considered that the Bureau was the watchdog for this country. He wanted to protect the United States of America. He was married to the FBI. I don't think any woman could ever have competed with the way he felt about the job. That was the thing he nurtured. That was his life.